It's time for us to travel. You fasten your seatbelts now. This evening, we're going to go to Pompeii. We're going to ride the train from the city of Rome to the south, down to the Bay of Naples, and there we're going to disembark and walk among the ruins of the ancient city of Pompeii. It's only barely an outline now, barely to be seen there, about 12 miles north it is, the shadow of what's left of Mount Vesuvius. In 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius, after giving several warning blasts, exploded with a terrific explosion that almost instantly darkened the sun. Now, there had been sufficient warning. For days and days, it had been puffing and blowing and threatening. It had on one occasion prior sent out such a plume that folks decided it was time to get out of Dodge, as the saying goes. So many of them went down to the Bay of Naples, got in their boats, and pushed off with sufficient supplies to last a day or two or more. And then the majority of them decided to come back, and they paid the price too great. In 79 A.D., the mountain exploded suddenly, instantly, and it buried this city, which we believe to have been about 25 to 30,000 in population, and also the sister city of Herculaneum between 18 and 22 feet of ash, lapili, which is a little BB-like substance, and, uh, and just dirt and junk. The city then became much like a time capsule. It was as if someone had put several things inside a container and then put a seal upon the lid of the container and buried it and left it there for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years did go by. In 1745, a man by the name of Charles of Bourbon was digging a canal from the snowmelt of Mount Vesuvius to the north down to the Bay of Naples in order that folks could live there on those pure white sand beaches and there overlooking the beautiful blue water so they could live there and have fresh water to drink. And as he dug, he came to a well. And he looked down with a light inside the well and he saw down there a street and a sidewalk. What had obviously happened was that some time prior, who knows how long before, someone had decided to look for fresh water by the digging of a well and broke through into the burial ground of the city of Pompeii. But they didn't seem to pay much attention to it. Charles of Bourbon, however, put men with torches down inside, and then the announcement was made round the world, we have found a buried city. Excavations then began that continued till this very day. And it was so fascinating in that here we have a whole society that was encapsulated almost instantly. We're able now to know how they lived, in what style they lived, how their homes were furnished, in many cases what their morals were or were not, and did they have pets, and, and what all happened? What kind of things did they eat? It was all to be discovered when they lifted the lid on the city of Pompeii. So let's begin to lift the lid tonight, you and I, shall we? We're going to walk down some of these streets. By the way, I think you can notice here, and maybe even better here, yes, here are the pillars and on each of those pillars, there is a number. This one happens to be 16. And 17 and 18, and over on the opposite side, in the museum, there is a big book with a number that coordinates to this, and it tells what kinds of businesses were operated on the insides of these buildings. And in many cases, it tells what kinds, uh, the, the names rather, of the folks who owned and operated the business. And we're going to see the evidence of all of that in just a little bit. For your interest's sake, this is akin to going to, oh, the Columbia Center Mall. There's a good illustration. This is the mall of the ancient city of Pompeii. Now, I want you to notice this street. This is Main Street. And the other street that we just looked, well, maybe we'll back up one 
Here you see that we have uh, my buddy standing with one foot on one side of the sidewalk, and then his other foot is on the rock. And from here, I'll have you notice two or three other things, if I may. Firstly, I want you to notice again over around these pillars. Look over here to the extreme left. Here's the best way to see it, right there. Between the two pillars, there is a niche. There is a groove carved in the stone. That, ladies and gentlemen, is where the doors, the sliding doors, slid in the groove. They were opened in the morning and slid shut at night. And so, in our patio still today, we have sliding doors. They let us outside of our master bedrooms. Sliding doors originated here in and around Pompeii, and certainly from the Roman world. And then you'll notice another thing or two. You see the street that is lower than the sidewalk, and, and there's a curb that's separated, and that was for the purpose of safety and cleanliness. You didn't want the folks walking down in the streets where there were horses and oxen and wagons and that sort of thing, and not only that, you didn't want them walking down there um, where the horses and donkeys had been. You get the idea, don't you? For reasons of sanitation and for reasons of safety, the street separated from the sidewalk. Well, that leaves us then wondering about that stone. This is the reason for the stone in every street. The narrower ones need only one, but Main Street, as we noted, and shall again, required three. It gets in the summertime here very hot, but quite unusually, the, hot, the heat here is not... Um, it is not like that that you would find in Florida, where there's a lot of humidity, or down on the Gulf Coast. There's, in fact, very little humidity here. High temperatures, but very little humidity. Sort of like a, a, a desert, an arid sort of a feeling to the air. Therefore, then, in the summertime, they would, from the aqueducts, bring in, open the gates, and bring in fresh water and fill the streets with water up to near the top of the curb. And when the afternoon and evening breezes blew, it would blow across the water in the streets and air condition the city in the same way that a swamp cooler works here in our areas. Fascinating. And so on Main Street, it took three of those steps to get across from one side to the other. Notice something else, too. You see the deep ruts here that have been carved over the centuries as the result of the turnings of the wagon wheels. Most remarkable. There's much more to see. We're going back now down the streets in the shopping area and the areas of government, and we're going to spend some time and notice what kind of businesses were conducted here, and in some cases, even the family members who conducted the business. National Geographic magazine, only just a few months ago, did a special on these two cities, Pompeii and Herculaneum. And as I mentioned at the outset, the excavations continue till this very day. And they found, they made some discoveries that were unknown since, you know, 18th, the 18th century when the excavations began. And among those discoveries, it was learned that it was the position often of the man who was running for mayor or maybe for governor of the county. That's the way we'd say it in our comparisons today. He would make this promise. If you vote for me this November, I promise to put on your street corner a fountain so that you don't have to walk a long ways to the canal to get your water to bring home. And so now on nearly every street corner, there is the remains, or in this case, the completeness of a fountain. And you'll notice something interesting about this one. The figure has a mouth. It's the figure, by the way, of an Italian boy. And the water comes out of his mouth and fills this cistern. And um, if you lived even in the poorer section of town or, or the middle class section, you need not go far. Nearly every corner had one of these. In this case, when it filled the cistern to overflowing, the overflow would run out this little niche back down into the streets that were filled with water. The wealthy folks had indoor plumbing, as we're going to see just a little bit from now. And so we're going to stop, first of all, you and I, at the Curia. The sign says Curia. That is the Latin word for the Senate. 
During the bad weather in Rome, the Caesar would come down to the Bay Area to spend a few weeks or perhaps even months here in the warmth of the beautiful sun and enjoying the blue waters off of the Bay of Naples. When he would come down here, he would bring with him many of his lawmakers. Today, we'd call them the cabinet and some of the main senators, you see. And here in this curia, the Senate, they would make laws, pass laws, vote laws that would have an effect throughout the whole of the known world. Because as we studied our first night together here, Rome for many, many, many years was in charge of much of the, the civilized world, certainly the West. All right? Now as we move on down the street, we come to a little shop. It says Bottega del Frut Vendiolo Felix. This was a fruit and vegetable stand, a farmer's market. That would be the nearest thing that we know uh, to the reality here. And furthermore, we know the name of the man who operated the place. His name was Felix. Now, how did they know? How did they make these discoveries? How could they be sure? Two ways. There were clay records, records that became in stone, written upon clay, clay tablets, and then over the centuries it turned hard as stone, and records of purchases and sales and records of the family names were to be found in and on those clay tablets. But perhaps even more importantly, in the excavations they would often come to a cavity. And at the outset they were just breaking in and paying little attention, but some scientists said we're making a mistake here when we come to these cavities, these hollows, instead of just smashing in, we're going to carefully into this bubble make a little hole about the size of a pencil, and then through that hole we're going to slip a rubber tube, and through the rubber tube we're going to pump a very liquid plaster of Paris-like substance, wait until it hardens and solidifies, and then chip away the ash and the lapilli and see what we find. And so in cases, as in this shop, they found melons, they found tomatoes, and they found bell peppers. And that's how we know then, by the records on clay tablets and by the evidence of the excavations of those little hollows, what kind of business was operated here. The fruit vendor by the name of Felix. Now just down the street a little ways, we come to another place, and this place tells us what happened here, and it also tells us the name of the man. This says this is the tavern of a guy by the name of Antonio, and I wouldn't be too surprised if they didn't refer to it as Tony's place. Huh? <laughs> Let's have a look around, shall we? I stood here to shoot this picture, and I saw this marble-colored bar, and then I went over to the left, and I saw this oven. It had originally been completely covered with marble, but some of the marble has fallen away to expose the bricks. And by the way, any time you see that long, narrow brick, you can be quite sure that that is from the Roman era because that's the way they made bricks, the style and the size of the Roman brick. And so I stood here and thought and shot a picture or two, and then it came to me. This had to have been a pizza parlor. What do you think, huh? If that isn't a pizza oven, I've never seen one. And the bar over there is where you choose your root beer or 7-Up, don't you suppose? Someone said, and I think rightly so, pizza was born in Italy but grew up in the United States. We eat far, far more pizza than they do over in Italy. And ours is quite different, matter of fact. Well, I don't know if it was um, Domino's or Pizza Hut, but Charlie's Tavern looks to me like a pizza parlor. Let's look around further. Out at the entry, out at the street level, there is another bar, and this one is curious in that it has big holes. The bar was made to be watertight. And then the inside was filled with water, and the beverages, whether they be hard or fresh juice, I don't know, but they were put in earthen jugs, big earthen bottles, and then sat down inside this water, and that would keep the beverage cool throughout the day. Not ice cold, but much cooler than it might have been otherwise. My three buddies are putting on a little bit of a performance for you there. They're pretending as if they're stopping to have a beverage. 
I could imagine some guy on his way from the pl- job, play the workplace to his home, coming home a little late, and his wife asked him, what happened, dear? Did you have a flat tire? And, and he says, no, I stopped off at Tony's place for a cold one. <laughs> Look, you didn't even have to step out of the street in order to enjoy the beverage. You could stand right out in the street, and in the heat of summer, you would be ankle deep in cool water, huh? Refreshment on both ends. How unique. We look around in the backside, we see another of the bars, and it has one of those, uh, two of those openings, as you can see there, rather. And the earthen jugs are still in them. And then over in the corners, we see other of those great big bottles and still more back in the back room. Our next stop is at the bakery. And my buddy is leaning up against a big grindstone. Here the farmers would bring their grain, sell it for a cash crop, trade it for baked goods, or have it milled and then take the flour home so the ladies could make their favorite desserts or their favorite breads, I suppose. We're going to move on back now into the inside, and there is the oven. Ladies and gentlemen, back in there is a shelf, and that shelf has a big pit beneath it in which the fire burned. The shelf is made of stone, and the fire that burned would eat the rocks and the bread atop those in the pans, stone pans, would bake. Now, in the museum, there they have loaves of bread that were found here at the time of the excavations, now in the early part of the 19th century, 1815-16. They have the loaves of bread that were discovered here in this bakery on display in the museum. They're a little more than day old, (laughs) pretty crusty now. But it's a fascinating thing. Again, it just points out how the time capsule was lifted and we make discoveries about folks that we didn't know very much about before. Wherever the Romans went in number, they would build for themselves a Colosseum. And here we have the Colosseum of the city of Pompeii. And this, by the way, is in the area of the more recent excavations. I happened to be in Phoenix when a few weeks ago the Super Bowl was played and I was um, in an RV park only just a stone's throw from the great Phoenix University Coliseum and I noted that the Phoenix Coliseum was built after the style of the Roman Coliseum. I have noted further that where the Portland Trailblazers play and where the Seattle Seahawks play or wherever your favorite team plays, they play in a Coliseum that was based after that of the Roman era. Some of you said what goes around comes around, and others have said, hang on to your old neckties. (laughs) I don't. (laughs) We're going to climb. We're going to climb up the steps there, ladies and gentlemen, and we're going to go through one of those arches, and then we shall filter down into the seating area. There was a parapet wall that was about 12 feet high, to separate the players from the spectators and the players from the animals because there were African animals that were kept here. I have been asked, did Christians die here? Were Christians thrown to starved animals? And the historical answer is yes, not in near the number as is what happened over in Rome at the Great Colosseum where we may visit on another evening, but Christians did die at the Colosseum of Pompeii as well. It was a pagan world into which our Lord Jesus was born, and they worshipped a host of pagan gods, gods of the sun and the moon and the stars. These are the remains of the temple of Fortuna Augusta, and we're not going to go into that tonight, but when we're finished this evening, you may want to go home and pull it up on your computer or read it out of your encyclopedia. It was a fascinating theory behind Fortuna Augusta. But the main temple was the temple of Apollo. Now, Apollo was one of the names of the sun god, the Greek name of the sun god. And when the Caesar was in residence here, this is where he came to worship. Originally, this temple was covered over with beautiful white Italian marble. And it was said that on a clear day, when the sun was brightly shining and the white caps were glistening, this temple could be seen for miles and miles offshore, and it glistened 
like a diamond in the sunlight. So we can just imagine the emperor of the world, the leader of of much of the known world, coming right here to, uh, to pray to the many gods, sun, the moon, and the stars. Now I mentioned to you folks that the poorer folks, those who lived in the the, the townhouses and uh, and the condominiums and the cold water walk-ups, didn't have far to go for fresh water because nearly every corner had a cistern. But the wealthy folks had indoor plumbing, and we're going to begin now to see the evidence of some of that. If you look very carefully there, you'll see in the picture the piping that brought fresh water off the aqueduct. Twisted and turned and and joints of uh, stone pipe that were hollowed out somehow and then made together, turned and turned, and then went back inside. (laughs) Huh? That's exactly what it is. That's a public restroom. But in defense of my friend, I quickly need to say to you, he's only sitting there to change the film in his camera. (laughs) Here's how it worked. Fresh water came from off the aqueduct, out of the canal, if you please. On a gravity flow, it ran beneath these stone stools and carried all the sewer away to the treatment plant. Most remarkable, 500 years before the birth of Jesus, indoor plumbing. Now, we have seen where the poor folks lived and where the everyday man shopped. We're going to transition now and go into what over in Idaho we would call the mucky muck neighborhood. All right? (laughs) This is where the rich folks lived. Now, when I travel around through the cities and villages of the U.S., I will often come to a home or a property that has a sign up on a tree or up on a gate that says, beware of the the dog. Beware of the dog. Oh, and by the way, I must tell you, you know, we live in a day and age where we can learn so very much if we'll just be quiet and listen a little bit. And that's not easy for me, but this is what I learned from Judge Judy. (laughs) Now listen. If you put a sign on your door, on your fence, or on your gate that says, Beware the dog, you're only admitting that you knew in advance that you had a dangerous situation. So if you have one of those pit bulls that likes to take a bite out of everybody, don't put up a sign. Just let him be a surprise, I guess. (laughs) That's it. Did you, by the way, hear about that little guy that came running in the house screaming, crying, just screaming, Mama, Mama, you just scared to death. And his mom asked, what, what was the matter, honey? What's the matter? She said, that, that the neighbor's dog, a great big dog. And the mother said, as she inspected him, did he bite you, son? Did the dog, did he bite you? No, but he tasted me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, over here, instead of putting a sign on the gate or on the door or something, they simply, in the mosaic of the sidewalk, put a picture of this dog. He's in the attack mode, you see. He's crouching. He's tethered, and his fangs are bared. He's giving the warning, enter at your own risk. Beware of the dog. We, by the way, have a 10-pound attack poodle. (laughs) <laughs> and, and he'll taste you. <laughs> we step inside the home, and the first thing we notice is the hole in the roof. What's going on? Was there a strong wind? No. This is the atrium, ladies and gentlemen, and that hole is there winter, summer, spring, and fall. And if you're wondering what happens when it rains, the answer is very simple. The rainwater comes right in. But beneath that opening, there is a fountain in the floor and it's just a bit larger than the opening in the ceiling, and it serves two purposes. One is aesthetic. Every, every eye that came to this home 
would look at the fountain. Oftentimes, they'd have a little statue or something, we're told, in the center of that fountain. And so it was pretty, potted plants around it. But it had a practical side as well. Every person that came in the house, whether guest or family member, went over beside the fountain, removed their shoes, and bathed their feet. And that saved on the vacuum cleaning, you see. Not a bad idea. Every major room in this home looked out onto the garden, the dining room, the family room, the formal sitting room, and the major bedroom. Master bedroom, they all opened out onto the garden. Now, the plants here, of course, don't date back to the time of the explosion before Jesus, but the statuary, on the other hand, does, and that that isn't that old has been recopied from some of the ruins that were found here. Well, we mentioned a bit ago that during the time of the excavations, they would find these bubbles, and instead of just smashing into them, they finally came to the idea of filling them full of a material that would harden and then carefully chip away. And as they did that, they found not only the evidence of melons and tomatoes and eggplant, but also of other living things like this dog. Is this a dog's body? No. That had long, long ago returned to dust and ash to ash. But this is what the dog looked like when they chipped away the stone that had once been molten rock. And the evidence obviously is that the dog died as a result of asphyxiation, breathing that poisonous gas, died for want of pure air and oxygen. He died in a twisted and contorted form. And not only did the animals die in that way, but so also is the evidence that did the people as well. Here was a person that was found in the corner of the basement. And you notice the attempt to cover the nose and the mouth from the poisonous gas, trying to hold, you know, the hands over the nose and the mouth, but it didn't work. Many of these figures were found with their gems and their jewels and their gold coins in their hands. The evidence from National Geographic magazine, as I alluded before, is that many of them had been out on the bay. They had been maybe a mile or two offshore. They were out where they were safe from the explosion, safe from the fire that would follow, but they went back. They went back to claim their treasures. They went back to get their gold, to get their coins, to get their jewelry. They went back, many of them, simply because they did not want to leave their beautiful homes, and they paid a price too high, as you can see here and again. A prostrate form, again, with that vain attempt to shield the nose and the mouth. There are so many parallels, ladies and gentlemen, between their day and time and our own, so very many. If you did gay t today, at this day and age, give folks the choice of coming to meetings similar to these, perhaps, to learn the truths of Jesus, to see where we are in the stream of time, and to get ready to meet him in peace, get to know him better, memorize his promises. You give folks a choice between doing something like that or going to the Super Bowl, going to the high school basketball game, or going to the dance, where will the majority go? Yeah, elsewhere. They have their priorities in an improper place. The very fact that you folks are here tonight proves that you have your priorities in order. And I thank you so very much for traveling with me. And now we will continue with our program. The lead stir story on the world news tonight was the bad news. The price of crude oil broke an all-time high. They're rather sure that in the next week or two, it's going to break another record or two. I've noticed since I've been in the area that the price of gasoline, and even worse, the price of diesel, has jumped about 25 cents in 10 days. And we're paying the price, and we're suffering the hurt. Peggy tried to make an order for some video equipment a couple of days ago. And she was going to pay for that with our American Express card. And the folks at the place of business down in Phoenix said, 
well, um, there's something wrong with American Express, and, um, and maybe if you made the phone call down there. And so Peggy made a phone call, and they said, well, our computers are down. They said, really, what we're doing is just kind of uh, updating our computers, and, and maybe before the day is over, we'll have it all fixed up. So Peggy, just before the end of business back there, called again. No, they said, our computers are still down. And then a day later, we learned the truth. The power went out in Tampa, Florida, near, near the headquarter of American Express uh, cards and the financial cards. And you know what they first blamed it on? We're not sure. They're doing some research. They're saying today that this may not have been the case, that it may have been a man who just opened the wrong box and pushed the wrong button. But yesterday, there was the very strong suggestion that what had happened was some high school kid had somehow, with his computer, hacked in to the nuclear power supply and shut down the power. An interesting day that we've come to. Power outages that could shut down Wall Street and shut down the financial institutions of the world. Tonight we're going to talk about our trip trap troubled planet in its context with the final economic crisis. And before we go further, I want to say to all of you folks, Lyle is a loyal American. And I hope that that comes across. I have been to 62 other countries of the world, and one of the things that my world travel has done is make me love these United States of America. There's not another place like it on the face of God's earth. We ought to put in a thank offering every day for the privilege of living here. This is the great country, God's United States of America. But while I'm a loyal American, I'm at the same time a concerned American. And I discover that I'm not alone in my concerns. As I travel from north to south and east to west, I discover that there are thousands, yea, tens of thousands of Americans who, like myself, are concerned. And one of our grave concerns is the loss of freedom that we have known since basically 9-11. We have lost, ladies and gentlemen, more freedoms since the Twin Towers came crashing down than in all of the prior history of the United States together combined. I read not very long ago, again, from a news magazine that if you're the average person in the average American city, and yours probably wouldn't qualify, but it's getting close. If you're an average person who makes average trips to town in the average city, your picture is going to be taken about 270 times per day. You're going to be watched by a camera 270 times per day. Well, that'll happen to me about 75 times just over in Walmart. <laughs> I'm, I'm always looking up and kind of, I, I, didn't, did, I, I didn't put anything in my pocket, you know. <laughs> oh, but I did make a mistake. George, you won't tell anybody. I'm afraid I went through a red light. Oh, it was certainly turning pink. And then someone told me, didn't you see the sign up there that said they're watching you on camera? George, would you tell them I didn't mean to? <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> you. You'll fix it for me. All right. <laughs> okay. I thank you kindly. Look, yesterday, yesterday I picked up the Tri-City Herald newspaper. And here's the headline, Toxic Economy Looms. And it goes on to say it's a worrisome time. Growth, the, the gro soaring uh, economic ills are causing serious problems. And then it goes on to talk about the high ca cost of gasoline. And it moves further than that to talk about the serious crisis in the housing market. And they say together, this has the possibility to take us into a deep, recession, and perhaps even stagflation. We're not going to go into what stagflation is, but you economists, of course, already know all about that. I want you now, if you will, please, to open with me your Bibles to the last book for those who live in the last days and one of the last chapters, Revelation. Revelation, not the last book by accident. We need to say over and over again, but it's for those who are living in the end times. The time is at hand. And we've said again and again that prophecy is history written in advance, and history is the mere, mere reflection of, of prophecy, and they go together, prophecy and history like what? You memorize it, identical twins. Sure, prophecy and history, identical twins. And so right now, we're going to read together a little bit of prophecy. Revelation chapter 13 contains the most awesome warning to be found anywhere in God's Word, and I'm going to take up the reading at verse... 15. Revelation chapter 13, beginning with the 15th verse. 
And it says about a certain power, which we'll say more on another evening, he had power to give life to the image of the beast. That this image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image, that they should be killed. And he causes a few folks, some of the wealthy and some of the poor and some of the... Is that the way your Bible reads? Come on now, I have to check you out from time to time. He causes how many? I perhaps have said it before. It needs to be said, however, again. When you're studying for an exam... When you're studying communication, as I did at the graduate level, your professor will often say, and even in high school speech classes, I'll remember this, in your speech making, in your preaching, don't make all the statements. Don't say it's always like this or everybody is like that, for there are exceptions to every rule. And so don't, don't make all the statements. But here, God is making the all the statements. And He doesn't do it just once, He does it again and again. He doesn't say He causes some or a few or many, He causes all small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark either in their right hand or in their foreheads. And then in the following verse 17, and that nobody, no man could buy or sell unless he have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now what God is trying to get across to us here is this. When these things come down, it won't matter who you are or where you live. When all of this falls into place, it'll make no difference if you're the man who does the surgery beneath the great light, the attorney at the bar, or the guy that throws the garbage in the back of the truck or street, uh, sweeps the street. He causes all, small and great, rich and poor. Everybody is in the same kind of a situation. Now, this is another statement that needs to be made. We've done it before, but must of necessity do it again. The Bible is not just for we who live in the United States of America. We believe this is a special country, a God-blessed country certainly, but God's Word is not only just for those of us who live here in the United States. It is also for those who live in Japan and for those who live in Germany and those who are down in the Philippines and those you know, in Philadelphia. God's Word is for all of God's people all around God's earth. Therefore then, ladies and gentlemen, the warnings found in God's Word are not only just for Americans, but they're for all people all around the earth. Now, having made that point, I move to this one. For a long, long while I wondered how, Lord, could this be? How? This economic dictatorship to have an effect all around the world, over in Japan at the same time, out in India and other places, how could it possibly be? We are so diverse. We are so unique. We are so very, very individual. But in the last few years, ladies and gentlemen, this picture in many, many ways, particularly financial, has drastically changed. We're all now interconnected by computer money together. And what one country does, the other country does. You probably know that about 70% of the banking of the world happens out of Wall Street in New York City. And money is not sent in envelopes or safe pouches, but rather it is sent electronically. And consequently now there's a whole new fraud. A, a guy who really knows how to use his computer can have transferred from the big city bank out to his personal account somewhere in the Bahamas or over in Switzerland. And perhaps for months and months and months, or perhaps never, does anyone know the difference? How many of you folks have heard of Dr. Ben Carson? Gifted Hands, the surgeon from Johns Hopkins University. Have you read his latest book? It is fascinating. And he concludes with some interesting ideas. He said, I believe that it is time that instead of having checkbooks and instead of doing uh, computer work and, and paying our bills by the computer, that we now go to the eye picture. You put your eye either in your home at your home computer or at the bank and it reads your eye and your eye is more individual than your fingertip and instantly the transfers are, ma are made either into your account or out of your account. And he said, if we were to do this, we would instantly solve 90% of the major crime. Now you think about it. The guy that sneaks around and, and stops at the brothel there just outside of Las Vegas and pays with $100 bills is not going to be able to do that. 
and the mafioso type who gives some guy $50,000 to knock off his business partner is not going to be able to do that. When you look at it from that vantage point, it makes a lot of sense. We could suddenly reduce crime, maybe 50, 70 percent, but we would be sacrificing our freedoms. Exactly so. So the devil's last attempt to take total control of the world is going to be through the economy, through money. The love of money? You remember our Lord Jesus there said, you can't serve both God and mammon. That's the reading from the King James, but the translation in the new language, the, the modern language is very simple. You, you can't put me first and also have great love for money. It's not going to work. The devil doesn't yet understand that. And so he's going to use money and the economy and the control of it to try to force men and women into a mold that they otherwise would not choose to be in. He can't believe that there can be some with characters so sterling that they can't be bought or sold. My favorite writer outside the Bible put it in these words, the greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as is the needle to the pole. Men who will not be bought or sold though the heavens fall. Worldwide implications. I recently made a trip again to Europe. And I discovered that over in Europe, even though their euro dollar is now very strong in comparison to ours, about worth, worth about 40% more than our dollars. Oh, and by the way, that brings to my mind another thought. Did you know that many, many of the major companies that do business with us, whether they sell us oil or they sell us some other commodity, refrigerators or Toyotas, they're not wanting payment in American dollars because as soon as they take the American dollars, they are taking a 40% discount. And so they want us to trade our money with the euro dollar or with the Japanese yen. And some of them are even willing to take the Mexican peso in, change, in exchange for rather than than the U.S. dollar. A strange situation that we've come to, but one that God said would happen just before Jesus comes back again. And so I've noticed that the problems that we're facing here in terms of the economy, the housing market, just one example, is much greater over in England, much greater than here. Here in the United States, we sent out to our kids College kids, oh, and even in the last few months, they've been sending credit cards unsolicited, unasked for to eighth graders. Did you know that? Yeah. Eighth grader opens his mail, and there's a credit card. And so he runs down and buys him $100 worth of gum. <laughs> we, it's so strange. Really, it is. But, but we have made credit available. We have said, here, use it, enjoy it, live it up. Oh, and if you'll take the credit that you have on your other card, says this big company, if you will transfer that credit over to our card, we will give to you no interest for three months. And after the three months, we will only charge you for the next six months 4%, 5%. And we fail to read the small print, ladies and gentlemen. And now we're discovering that when you read the small print... They have an ability that if your payment is late by one half hour, oh, and if it says that your payment is due on the 30th of the month and, and you mail your letter and it gets there by the 30th of the month, it is still considered to be late and now the interest rate goes from 5%, 4%, up to 28%, and then they add late fees that can bring the interest rate up to as high as 40%, and then they begin to, to add the interest to it. It begins to compound daily, and before very long, you're in debt up beyond your eyeballs, and they're going to take away your home. And so the housing market has been collapsing. Have you noticed that in your area? My hometown is Boise, Idaho. My daughter happens to have a home in Boise, Idaho that she's been attempting to sell for about the last two years. They began, and because it's a lovely home, uh, and I've seen some very lovely homes around here, 
It was a home that was appraised at around $400,000. And so they thought they would start maybe just a little bit above the appraisal, and nothing happened. No one even came to look. And so they dropped the price, about $25,000, and nobody came to look. And so they dropped the price again, another $25,000, and one person came to look, and they dropped the price again, and nobody has been to look in the last three months. They had changed realtors on three different occasions, and finally my daughter confronted the last one and asked him, Sir, why aren't you doing anything? And he said to my daughter, Lady, it's obvious that you don't understand. Here in this little community of Eagle, Idaho, which has a population smaller still than your city, here in Eagle, this suburb of Boise, there are 1,200 homes on the market. 1,200 homes that are for sale. And in greater Boise, the number is up near 100,000. And the banks are wondering what to do. What are we going to do? And so the Federal Reserve, and this, let's see if I can't find it here. The Federal Reserve Chairman spoke yesterday. Well, it doesn't matter. But Neil Cavuto asked him, what are you going to do? He said, we're going to lower the interest rate. Neil Cavuto asked, how do you do that? He said, we're going to print more money. And Neil said, I thought that's exactly your answer. Now he said, where, who is going to stand behind the money? Because it's practically hot air. Who's going to stand behind the money? And the Chairman of the Federal Reserve said, probably China. Ladies and gentlemen, Japan and China own much of the United States. In 10 years, the United States has moved from a position of being the largest creditor to being the largest debtor nation in all this world. In other words, 10 years ago, more countries owed us money than was owed to any one other single country. We indeed were the wealthy Americans. And now, my dears, we owe more money to more countries than does any other single nation, including those impoverished third nations of the world that are so deeply, deeply in debt. And the amount is mushrooming. You know what happens to interest that is compounded and then super compounded. And it was the former chairman of the uh, Chrysler Motor Company, Lee Iacocca, who was quoted very recently as saying, we need now to face the facts. It is a reality. We will never, never be able to pay the interest on the national debt. And then he went on to conclude, it is a bitter legacy that we have left to our children and to our grandchildren. Here's something that came from the news magazine just about four days ago. The stock market, as you're probably aware, has dropped again today about 300 points. We've gone in about a month and a half from somewhere around uh, 14,000 to 12 and sometimes a little less than that. And then it asks, are we living in a 9-10 economy? Global financial markets were rocked last month, falling rising defaults, affecting mortgage block securities. What does this mean for the world's money supply and for confidence in the Western financial institutions? Are we on the verge of a major upheaval and a collapse of the world economy? Well, my dears, the Bible says the answer to that question is yes, yes indeed. By the way, if you folks want some information that is brand new and updated and trustworthy, you'll find it here in this issue of In These Times. Killer credit. It'll just, it'll shock you. I'm rather sure that it will. What is the national debt? When you and I had meetings like these here eight years ago, was it? Eight years ago. The national debt was around five trillion dollars. But yesterday I spent most all of the afternoon at the library doing some research and I found a quotation. I want to read it to you and then, and then you'll be able probably to tell me who said it, who made it and when. Listen now, the budget should be balanced. The treasury should be refilled. The public debt should be reduced. And the arrogance of public officials should be controlled. Who do you think said that? The guy that's running to be for, for, the, for the office of president? No. That was an old fellow by the name of Cicero who lived 106 years before the birth of Jesus. Huh? 
What goes around comes around. What is the national debt today, ladies and gentlemen? Well, this was yesterday at uh, four in the afternoon, nine trillion, three hundred and twenty-nine million, uh, three hundred and twenty-nine billion, seven hundred and twenty-two million, nine hundred and seventy-one thousand, two hundred and thirty-six dollars and ninety-seven cents. That was yesterday. It's much, much worse than that, of course, today. Now, this is the bottom line. While our government is in debt to the tune of almost $10 trillion, the gross personal debt of the peoples of the United States is almost equal to it. What does that mean? That means that for our cars, our automobiles, our washing machines, our homes, and the clothes that we charge with our credit card, we American people are in debt almost to the same degree as is our government. And so where does the blame lie, huh? What other country in all of the world uh, solves its problems, its financial problems? You know, everybody, we're losing our homes and, and, and folks are not spending money because they don't have money to spend. And so here, we're going to give you a, a tax uh, refund. We're going to give every one of you folks 600, at least every family, we're going to give you $600. Now, this is what we want you to do with the $600. We want you to run down to the mall and spend that money. We want you to make a down payment on a car. We want you to put it down on a new set for your living room. We are the only country in all the world that solves our indebtedness by encouraging our people to go in debt. You tell me one other country in the world that encourages its folks instead of saving, instead of putting some money in the bank to go out and spend like crazy. It's madness. Madness. The national debt is increasing at $1.2 million every minute. 76 major banks, and I'm reading again from the news service, 76 of the major banks in the United States are on the brink or are near failure. Federal Deposit Insurance. You know, we have the mistaken idea somehow that the FDIC is a government outfit, that we vote someone in there and they take charge. No, not at all. Not anywhere near it. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, I'm sorry, I misspoke, the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve, it's not owned and operated by the government. We don't vote anyone into office, but rather it is made up of about a dozen of the wealthiest men in the world. And they're the ones that are loaning the money, and they're the ones that are getting the big returns, and they're the ones that are getting into our back pockets and stealing from us, printing more money and passing on the debt to other countries. You buy it from us, someday we'll pay you back. And now we're going, as we conclude, see that these things are all related to the end time events. God knew what was going to happen, and He knew what would bring about this economic dictatorship. I'm going to share with you very quickly now as we move toward a conclusion what has put us in this financial difficulty. The cost of illegals coming across our borders, both north and south, are costing us multiplied millions of dollars every single day. Now, please understand, Lyle is not a racist of any kind. If I know my own heart, I know better than that. And then we have these natural disasters. We've had Katrina, and right on top of it, Rita, and it has cost our government billions and billions and billions of dollars. And then we have the welfare rolls. We have the folks that uh, are being paid not to work. And, and some of them would work and, and perhaps ought to work. Uh, down in the Southland not too long ago, a guy said to me, you know, there are lots of folks down here in the South that wouldn't work if you gave them a job in a donut factory. Now, I guess that's a pretty good job. I don't know. And then we have also a war raging out in the Middle East, and that war in the Middle East is calling, costing the peoples of the United States $10 billion every single month. And then we have earthquakes, and, and we dip into our pockets, and all we Americans are fine to help the folks who are in the earthquake. And then we have the fires that burn down the most expensive neighborhoods in Malibu and elsewhere, and uh, they, they give them loans that are backed by the government and free money besides that. And we poor folks who live out here in middle America America, we're paying the bill. And then we have medical care. It is considered that within five years, 25% of the national budget is going to go to medical costs. And then we have 
the homeland security problems with surveillance and we have border fences and border police that are costing us increasingly and we then have um, uh, these horrors of the annual income that drops and drops in comparison to inflation and deflation and stagflation and someone said to me well really we're better off than we were when I was a kid well I've looked into that and I found that it's not true in 1942, and that, by the way, was the year that some really, really fine people were born. <laughs> now, again, this isn't the history of civilization, folks. In 1942, the annual income was $1,800 per year, and a new home cost $3,000. You earn in two years enough money to pay off your home. In 1960, gasoline cost 25 cents a gallon. It meant if you worked for one hour at the minimum wage of $2 per hour, you could buy eight gallons of gas today. Can you buy eight gallons of gas today with an hour's wage? Huh? I don't think so. I don't think so. Our Lord has to come, folks. Uh, our Lord has to come. There's going to soon come a collapse. It might be the Twin Tower picture all over again. It might be something in Los Angeles. It might be a, a natural disaster, but it is going to demand somebody to come along to take the reins in hand. You know, the American people traditionally have been taught to say uh, dictatorship horrors never, not here in the land of the free. But one day soon, they're going to say, thank God finally someone has come along with enough guts to put on the brakes. Thank God. And no man could buy or sell. Now is the time to make the spiritual preparation. Now is the time. Lay not up for yourself treasures on earth, but rather put your treasure in the bank of heaven. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of your word. I'll be with you to the end. I'll never allow my children to go hungry or to see their seed begging bread. Your bread and your water will be sure. My grace is sufficient. Dear God, help us like Abraham to set our sights on things that are eternal and not to worry at all about having the finest things here and now, but to be very concerned about the hereafter. May we long anxiously for the coming of Jesus. Oh, to look in his face. That'll be glory in Jesus' name. Amen.